from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. The so-called modern data stack is getting a facelift and perhaps a complete body makeover. As the point of control shifts from the DBMS to the governance layer, we cite three dynamics that highlight a reshaping of today's data landscape, including one, as aspirations of key data players expand, they are disrupting the established norm. Two, data platform vendors, you know, they used to compete amongst each other, that's it, but as they pursue TAM expansion, they enter new competitive environments. And three, these market and stack dislocations cause confusion for customers, which presents both opportunities and risks for both customers and vendors of data platforms. Hello and welcome to this week's The Cube Research Insights powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, Cube Research Analyst, Principal Analyst Rob Streche and I review our learnings from SuperCloud 7, get ready for the next data platform, which featured the leading voices and thought leaders in data. We're gonna present a view of the shifting data stack as we see it today. We'll review some data points from recent ETR survey and close with some final thoughts. Rob. Thanks for taking some time here in our Palo Alto studio. We had SuperCloud 7 yesterday. Yeah, no, it's great that we got to be out here. And I, I think, again, the learnings that we got out of yesterday really codified a lot of what we've been thinking already that tied with the research we did with ETR uh, around the Snowflake and uh, Databricks overlap customers and how they see the future going. And, and I think, again, it, it brings to bear that there's a lot of uh, things to figure out and play out still in this in this environment. Yeah, indeed, so let's get into it and bring up the first slide if you would. So really the four things, there were a lot of things at SuperCloud 7. The first one is, is we say the shifting controls, uh, uh, sands, the shifting sands of control and the value in the layer of the stack and this new so-called modern data stack. We're gonna talk about that and show you what we mean, but generally we see the, the control point has always been the DBMS that's moving to the governance layer and that brings just a lot of really interesting conversations, Rob, that we'll get into. Um, that governance layer uh, is in play. And why we say here with a lot of knives sharpening. Yes, I, I think when you start to look at that governance layer and you see that really the people in that layer, some have been there for years, like, I mean, Informatica has been there for 30 years plus, and you start to look at the new ones that are coming up in that governance layer you have people who are moving into that, like the Starbursts who look at data mesh is playing a, a role in that. Not to mention all of the ones that we had on yesterday with uh, you know, Polaris and Unity from Snowflake and from Databricks being open sourced. I, I think there's a lot of things in play at that layer that governance and catalog is really at play. Yeah, and if you bring that same slide back up again, the other point we want to make is that that organizations, are, they got a mix of open and proprietary formats. We're talking about uh, uh, things like open table formats are all over the place uh, as well. These governance solutions, there's a, there's a mix there. You've got governance from the cloud vendors. You've got new emerging governance from you know, open source. Uh, you, you've got catalogs of catalogs. So that's creating a lot of uh, confusion. And as you said up front, as data platforms execute on this idea of TAM expansion, they face new competition. And here's why, because uh, they're essentially, Rob, having to go beyond metrics and analytics and dashboards and BIs, and they're trying to build digital representations of their business. What does that mean? That means they have to get into actual operational data that is in legacy systems like Salesforce, like Oracle, like SAP. Okay, and those software companies all have designs on building digital representations of their business. So as we said earlier, data stack companies like Snowflake, like Databricks and others compete with each other. Hey, which data stack are you gonna purchase? Now, it's as they move up the stack, they're entering a new domain. Your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think the data platforms are moving up and moving down. I, I think we had George Frazier on from Fivetran. And when you talk about data pipelines and how they really bring the data together and how you harmonize it in a data lake or in a data uh, data platform. And then you have to reharmonize it because you have so many different pieces coming across that and you may have cross data platform 
actual data that has to be harmonized again and brought together in that kind of semantic way, but it all has to be governed. And I, I think that is why there's a lot of churn and a lot of confusion within the organizations about where are they going to actually do this harmonization? Where are they going to do the metrics layer? Where are they going to say the people, places, and things, and what that really looks like from uh, a re representation perspective? And I, I, again, to your point, TAM expansion, as they move up and are coming closer to what the hyperscalers have built as PaaS services in a lot of cases, they're definitely going to hit a new breed of competitor in that where maybe they were able to take out the data platform players and uh, co-opetition inside those hyperscaler clouds, I think they're going to find it a little bit more uh, challenging when they have to do that, plus have to deal with the fact that maybe they're not on-prem. And a lot of the data that is being harmonized from these pipelines is from on-prem. You know, it's a really interesting point you're making because Snowflake and Databricks have proven they can compete with and partner with the hyperscalers. Hyperscalers are happy to have them there because they sell more compute and more storage. At the same time, Databricks and Snowflake, this is what they do. They're specialists in data. So they've effectively competed with whether it's Redshift or even BigQuery, which you got to give a lot of props to from a cloud native standpoint. Microsoft has always been, you know, somewhat other than SQL Server, somewhat deficient in that sort of modern data stack. So they've competed well there. Now they're entering this world of business logic, you know, and, and touching, you know, that applications in a much deeper way you know, that's a whole new world. Uh, they don't own that type of business logic today. The data resides, you know, in those stovepipes locked in. And as you see companies like Salesforce make moves with their data cloud and what they're doing with MuleSoft, they're seeing these modern data stacks and saying, hey, we can do that too within our own domain. Yeah, and I think again, when you start to look at how they're all bringing, trying to have a full stack and allow people to build data products and agents and AI and, you know, when we talk about those uh, data apps and digital representations of the business, it, there's a lot of complexity up above the data. And, you know, it's not just the governance, it's getting into how, where the new value is being seen, which is, hey, above those knives being sharpened and things of that nature. So let's take a look at the next slide. Now, last week we presented in Breaking Now, a very detailed review, Eric Bradley, myself, of a survey that we, we co-authored with ETR Rob, myself, the, the, the data gurus at ETR, we just want to pull out one slide uh, that we talked about quite extensively yesterday. This one, um, it's a survey of 105 joint Databricks and Snowflake accounts, if you're not familiar with what we did last week. And here you say, at a scale of one to five, how much do you agree or dis uh, uh, disagree with the following statements? This is the percent of those 105 that said four or five, they, they, they agree strongly uh, or they agree. So you can see here on the left-hand side, security and governance first. 86% and 70% respectively said, we think about security and governance before we do anything else. Okay, so that generally would favor, you know, a company like Snowflake where they say, bring it all in and we'll govern the whole thing. The second cohort, however, says, we're gonna avoid lock-in basically at all costs. So that's a, a sentiment that would obviously favor Databricks. And then in that pink area, you've got all these conflicting priorities. For instance, with a 45% say organization is prioritizing consolidating data into a single integrated tech stack, even if that means sacrificing flexibility to use different tools. The next one is, it's really important that we consider open, open source or first. Or, or, or two away, giving analysts the freedom to choose the tools that they use to analyze the data is more important than consolidating data into si single paradigm. I, I think these are, like you said, completely conflicting priorities, and it's a third, a third, a third. And I think, again, this, you know, really highlights that confusion and the actual personas, different personas that are going on inside these organizations that are going to really have to be, you know, you know, we talk about data wrangling. This is persona wrangling inside these organizations where these people are going to have to get aligned. And is that governance that's going to align that? Is it thou shall do it this way? And is it this way for that application and they, those data products? Or is it across everything? I know talking to some organizations, some very large organizations, 
they're absolutely going through this. And they've had multiple reorgs within these companies in the last two years. I know of one company in particular in Massachusetts, they've had three reorgs just around this area trying to figure out what are the right personas to bring to bear to get to those new fangled apps that they want, these data apps that are based on things that are in things like Snowflake and Databricks, based on data in uh, applications and even in spreadsheets and data that's actually residing on the mainframe. And they're trying to bring this all together and figure out what persona is going to own this and own the architecture and own all of the building. Oh, by the way, which which business units are customers of this and how, do, how does that all play out? It's super confusing. And that's why I'm not surprised to see that wide middle swath of that. Yeah, bring that back uh, that slide back up if you would, because because to your, to a point you made earlier, if you go back one from that one you just highlighted, thirty nine percent said we plan to keep our core intellectual. Uh, no, sorry guys, the VAR charts. Yeah, that one. We plan to keep our core intellectual property uh, data on prem for at least the next twelve months. Yeah. Okay, so there's another dislocation. Then you go to all the way to the right on the pink one. Keeping data in open table formats is unnecessary. If you have a robust data warehousing system that you can depend on, can you imagine the conversations and, and the wars that are going on internally here for those that are saying, no, that's not true. We got to we, we we absolutely need open table formats because we want to bring any any compute to engine to, to our data. And others say, no, no, you don't need to do that. And then if you go all the way to the right, we call them the data rebels. We tend to worry about governance as we go. Ah, damn the torpedoes. And then the far right. This cohort was really important. We called them uh, last week the swing vote. Data security is less important than creating a stack that allows for rapid innovation. The reason we call that the swing vote is because in an analysis that we showed last week, uh, ETR correlated that 14% with those that were most likely to move off of Snowflake onto Databricks. Yeah, I, I, I look at that and say that this makes so much sense. I Again, when you get into what persona that might be, if you look at the, the analysts, freedom for the analysts, freedom for all, free, do what you need to do with your data and answer that question for that business unit right now. I can't be, you know, hamstrung by guardrails and, you know, all of these different things that are being put in place. So I, I look at it and go, okay, I get it. You want to get this answer out because your KPIs and your, your MBOs are getting this data and making sure that everybody's data driven and really focused in the same way. But at the same time, at what cost and at what risk to the business are you doing that? And I think that's the, the conflicting, you know, from that 45% on over is, is really where I think this is where the knife sharpenings happen because people are looking at that and going, Ooh, we're going to have to go and we're going to have to roast somebody. Yeah. Somebody's getting roasted out of those categories and is going to lose out. And governance is going to be put across that uh, so that they can harmonize all of this. So let's take a look at the next sort of stack chart here. This is how we are perceiving uh, the emerging uh, data stack. The so-called modern data stack ain't so modern anymore. It's kind of getting long in the tooth. But so let's build this up. So at the bottom, you've got cloud infrastructure. AWS, AWS started that. And, and let's say, okay, AWS is sort of the gold standard for cloud infrastructure. There's obviously more. There's the cloud operating model. You know, there's on-prem capabilities, but is in the context of the modern data stack, set, cloud uh, uh, data warehouses, separating compute from storage, it's AWS got that all started with with Snowflake as the DBMS uh, uh, company. They kind of won that, you know, years ago. Whereas Databricks with Spark won the data pipeline uh, 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 mantle. And then now open table formats, it's not over yet, but Iceberg looks, Rob, like it's it's the favorite in, in open table formats, it's the most robust. Tabular, Ryan Blue and Company did a fabulous job of really up leveling, you know, the capabilities in open table formats. So that's that below that blue line that we're showing here, that's pretty much established, notwithstanding that iceberg adoption is still, you know, in the early days. But everything above that is where all the action is that we're going to talk about. But before we go there, anything you want to talk about on the below that line, the infrastructure, the DBMS, the data pipeline, and the open table form? Yeah, I think that to your point, it's it, there are so many people playing in that, that it's it, AWS one, but you have Google and Microsoft and Oracle and others coming up and it's they're, they've learned from what AWS did well 
and what maybe they didn't do as well. And they're really, you know, coming after them for that. And I think they're also all building on top of these. Because if you look at Databricks and Snowflake, right, they're, they're learning from each other and what they've done well in winning those battles there and adding those features along with, you know, a number of others who've been traditionally on-prem that have gone to cloud. But to your point, I think the the new one in open table formats, it, it definitely seems to be, and I think the ETR data, you know, definitely looks at it where it's like 15% now, but 70% intend on going to that open table format really soon. At least a very open to it, uh, it's kind of big maybe. Sorry, bring that back up if you would. So let's build from that layer up. And this is where it's it's more most fuzzy. So we have the the governance solution in the red. So we, we show, the intent here is to show at least, you know, some of that control point moving from DBMS into what we're calling the emerging strategic uh, point of control at the governance layer. And you can see here, there's a lot of folks here. We got Unity Catalog, which which Databricks open source. We got Polaris Catalog, which went sort of uh, 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 open source yesterday officially from Snowflake, um, uh, uh, which is, uh, sorry, Polaris uh, Catalog. But you've also got, Google's got a data catalog. Um, Microsoft Purview is trying to be the catalog of catalog. AWS has data zones. Uh, Informatica is is in there. Calibra uh, uh, has solutions. Alation has solutions, et cetera, et cetera. So now, and in, in, in we see arrows, you know, down and above. We can sort of debate uh, what should be in there, but there's a there's a there's the metrics layer with guys like DBT and at scale. Uh, we'll talk about the semantic layer in, in a moment. That maybe is misnomer. Maybe we could have drawn it differently. We'll talk about that. But let's focus for a moment here, Rob, on this governance. This picture, it doesn't even tell you know, the whole story. It's, it's so fragmented, and it's going to probably stay that way. Yeah, I, I think that it's going to be very fragmented because I think it, it is so complicated when you're talking about all of these different systems of record. And, you know, uh, George Gilbert and I, when we were talking to George and Gaurav from uh, Informatica and from Fivetran yesterday, when you started to break it down and we were having some off the set discussions afterwards and you, you look at, okay, it's not only that, but it's about lineage. And it's where did this data come from, especially as we get into the AI and okay, AI built either a side of data products or is a data product, depending on how you define it. And then you start to look at these agents that are pulling data from all over the place through that quote unquote semantic layer and governance layer. Okay, well now how do I know where that came from? Well, that's where the catalog of catalogs and being able to see across that layer is really important. Well, that takes partnerships, coopetition. There needs to be open standards and you need to be able to go around in some cases to the source to understand how how the data got to where it is because it may go through and ETL or an ELT and be different when it gets paired up in there. So I think what's important is understanding all of that entire, the data life cycle. And these folks, it's such a complicated, I hate to use the word mesh, I, I but it's like, well, or mess. Replace H with <laughs> double S. Yeah. It's a mess. Yeah. yeah. So I, when you start to look at it, I think that that's why this point of control is so strategic and it's so hard to solve for. And like we said, you know, Informatica has been at it for 30 years and it's not like, and they've made acquisitions and built new products and same thing that Unity and Polaris are aiming to do. Now, if we go open source, maybe we'll get more community in there and be able to bring that up and, you know, get that to be the catalog that then we deal build, you know, in uh, Snowflake's instance, you know, Horizon as the governance on top of Polaris, and that becomes the control point. So I, I think it's very interesting. We we didn't even get into the fact that there's probably about 20, 25 different startups in this space that all have features of what the governance layer needs to have, from the data discovery all the way through that lineage and being able to then uh, you know, represent a business in a certain way. It's in a way a small microcosm starting to look like the security market with so much fragmentation and so much best of breed. Now, I'm glad you brought uh, uh, up Horizon. We didn't show them on that chart. 
Uh, but but it's important because we had Benoit in here yesterday, Benoit Dajaville, who's the co-founder and, and head of product. He kind of hinted that for right now, we've decided to uh, open source Polaris, not Horizon. He also uh, corrected me because I've written that Her uh, Polaris is just the technical metadata. He said that's not, not actually true. We actually do lineage. What I didn't do with a follow-up question, and we will, we'll keep digging, is I did ask him, can I run Polaris without Snowflake? He said, yes. What I didn't ask him is, can I get the lineage without Horizon? And I think the answer is no, but I'm not positive. It, it could be also the RBAC. It could be a whole number of different things that you're in that governance layer that don't get passed to Polaris from Horizon. Because again, it goes back to what is going to be the control point. And I think they all have this idea that, hey, I, I have to be able to control this and I think rightly so, you start to look at it, you don't want it to be wide open. So RBAC is one of those things where I look at that and it took forever to solve it in general from, from a security, like you were talking, and the security landscape, if you remember back how many years ago, everybody had an RBAC solution. Yeah, right. And I, I think we're, I think that's a great analogy. I think that's where we are in this governance layer. It's like RBAC was you know, five, 10 years ago. And so this is why it's so confusing and so risky for customers. So what are they going to do? They're going to probably stovepipe. <laughs> and, and and so if you bring that chart back up, if you would. So, you know, this next layer, we call it the semantic layer. We put it in quotes only because it's such a misnomer. It's really not, you know, we call it the semantic layer. Sometimes we talk about data harmonization. We talk about a digital representation of your business, people, places, and things. We've talked about turning strings that databases understand into things that you know represent that business and being able to store that data that's what we're talking about there and that doesn't really exist in any functional or mature way in fact we asked moham rf who's the ceo and founder of uh, relational ai like how long is this going to take and it's like this is going to take a while we're not we're not there yet so that's what we mean by that quote unquote semantic layer now as you as you move up that stack, data products and agents into intelligent apps, this is where you start to see that new competition as these companies like Databricks and Snowflake expand their TAM. Obviously, the cloud guys are, are, are in there, but Palantir doing their own sort of what we're calling the semantic layer uh, and doing data products inside of their platform. Uh, Vertex AI as a sort of a, a, an app builder. Salesforce Data Cloud, we talk about that a lot. They're actually doing all this stuff, this vision um, of three customer 360 within the Salesforce environment, Microsoft Power Platform um, is is part of that. The, back to governance, their, their purview is a catalog of catalogs. They'll push down into other other catalogs. Um, but on top of that, the Power Platform is becoming very rich with a unified metadata. ServiceNow is 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 in that um, in that mix, and there are many others. These are new sources of value. And as we said, new sources of competition, Rob, for these data stack vendors. Yeah, and I, I think, again, when you start to look at it, uh, I mean, Salesforce, take them as an example. Everybody for years, I mean, when you look at Fivetran and how they brought Salesforce data together with some of your actual uh, first-party data that you were collecting, and that was really where Fivetran started with, with SaaS applications and being able to bring that data together with data that you collected from your your actual stores or uh, customer experience and what have you to really get a customer 360 profile. Well, when you start to look and break that apart, well, of course, Salesforce is like, why are we letting everybody take their data away and go do it, go process it somewhere else? They should be processing that here. Bring your data here and enrich it with the Salesforce data. So it makes total sense. But you also look as people move up that stack, like you were saying, and you get into agents and data products and intelligent data apps, you really get to the point where you're talking about things that I think the cloud and hyperscalers have really focused on for quite a while. I mean, Google's been really hyper-focused on that, and Microsoft has come around on that. And AWS with Bedrock and everything they're doing about Bedrock and you know has been with SageMaker for quite some time looking at that from an AI perspective. So I think it's gonna be very interesting in how they try to fight at that layer, 
but also how they try to hold serve below the blue line. Right. Because that below the blue line is still highly competitive, it yet not as highly differentiated as it used to be. And I think that's where you get into this, where you have other people like DBT, DBT Mesh, and you have also their semantic layer, where they're trying to move up stack from where they had started out in the data engineering and really the analyst roles, getting stuff into B, you know, BI, and same thing with like the at scales of the world, where their semantic layer is really focused on those metrics and being able to harmonize that for different BI tools and things of that nature. It's, it's really a lot, and it depends if you put that in a semantic layer up above or below and how it gets governed. And I think it does get governed, and that becomes the the why everybody's focused on governance as kind of that linchpin. And a lot of other dynamics in play. I was tempted to put Amazon Q in that chart. Uh, IBM has a very rich stack with with Watson X and Watson X governance and data. And so there's there's a there's a lot going on here. Let's let's wrap because I know you got to catch a plane here. We need to bring up the last slide and uh, I'll run through it, Rob, and then get your final thoughts. So this isn't going to happen overnight. There's a lot of work to do, as Mulham, a uh, 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 ref, alluded to. This is a three- to five-year journey, uh, and there's a lot of missing pieces. Yamak Dagani, I encourage you to go look at her uh, interview and, and session in SuperCloud 7. Uh, she's really proposing a way to – that governance layer could become a real bottleneck for companies, very clearly a kludge. Um, and, and so she's got some ideas as to how to, how to resolve that. Um, Look, the hyperscalers are a major player in this system, uh, and they are a wild card. We noted that within those 105 Databricks and Snowflake accounts, over a third said that the hyperscalers had more capabilities in in machine learning and AI. Um, so, you know, they're gonna they're gonna play in a big way. And look, as you were saying, the the below that line, data platforms they're sticky. It's a great business. It's their core. So they've really really got to you know, stay focused on that. And it's not easy to just get off of those data platforms. Maybe we'll see shifts of some workloads, some of the data engineering workloads, some of the pipeline workloads as part of the optimization play, you know, but the core is 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 hard to move off of. And that swing vote today is cost is affecting that those swings. And that could change if AI starts to throw up cash and brings really, you know, significant ROI. And the last point, and then I'll let you chime in here, Rob, is you know, confusion and chaos uh, sometimes means cash. It's opportunity, but it also, to your point earlier, brings risk. Yeah, and I, I think, again, when you bring these all together, it, we were kind of riffing on this yesterday and what would what would we, you know, be talking about in, uh, you know, Super Cloud 8 and things of that nature. And when you start to look at what we, as we look out, that's, you know, a couple months away that this is not going to be settled. I mean, this has been going on for quite a while and will continue. And I think the hyperscalers will be players in this, uh, either through, you know, innovation or acquisition. And I think that you'll see that uh, some new players that maybe have been on-prem traditionally. And when you start to look at where AI and inference goes, where it's more edge and, you know, some core, some cloud, those who can make that transition to hybrid or super cloud-like really are going to be, I think, the winners in that or be able to hold serve in some cases. Because uh, you look at some of the winners today, really not when 50% of apps that we see in some of the ETR data that are cloud native are being built on premise now. I, I look at that and go, you, you, that really could change the dynamics of where these agents and data products are built. Uh, and of course, I think there's a ton of opportunity, like you said, and I think there'll be a lot of robust startup initiatives in this area. Rob, thanks so much. We appreciate it. We'll let you get out of here. Uh, we encourage you to go to thecube.net, check out the videos from SuperCloud 7. Uh, so, so much content. TransUnion, really interesting story. Walmart, uh, we have basically bookends on our keynotes, Ali Goetze. And Benoit Dajaville. I mean, it's election year. You got RNC, DNC. We'll let you choose who's who, but check it out because they have very differing philosophies uh, and beliefs as to how to get to the same place, which is you know driving data value and so much more content. Check out uh, SiliconAngle.com, obviously, and and thecuberesearch.com. Okay, that's it for now. 
Thanks to the Palo Alto crew. We appreciate you guys letting us use your studio today and producing this episode. Alex Morrison and Ken Schiffman uh, on our weekly production and do our podcast. And Kristen Martin and Cheryl Knight help get the word out on social media and in our newsletters. And Rob Hof is our EIC over at Silicon Angle. Remember, all these episodes are available as podcasts. Wherever you listen, just search Breaking Analysis Podcasts. We publish each week on thecuberesearch.com and siliconangle.com. And you can email me, david.vellante at siliconangle.com or DM me at dvellante or hit me up on LinkedIn on our post if you want to get in touch. Definitely check out etr.ai. Props and shout out to ETR for this week, really enabling such wonderful uh, supporting data from the customer, working backwards from the customer. We love that. Best survey data in the enterprise tech business. This is Dave Vellante for Rob Streche for the Cube Research Insights, powered by ETR. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time on Breaking Analysis.